do you feel that Paris should have been prepared after those attacks to uh, try not to have these attacks in uh, November occur? Or Just in America, it's very, very, very difficult to prepare for lone wolf attacks. I mean, everywhere and nowhere is safe at the same time. I mean, any lone lunatic with a gun or a, a group of lunatics can go into a movie theater, a hospital, or a university. But that should not dictate how we live our lives. Sure, gunmen might be able to end your life in a certain sense, but they shouldn't dictate how you live it. Living in Paris, France, Europe, there is a certain lifestyle that exists there that was not changed by the, the attacks, and nor should it. The attacks happened. <coughs> France and Europe can't prepare themselves more for lone wolf attacks other than increasing surveillance programs, which they have seen an increasingly amount of backlash for from French citizens. I mean, they themselves are considering their lives are very important, but they don't want a realistic version of 1984 in their city or their homes. Hispanics vote non-Hispanic. Then it's a mischaracterization. Go ahead. If we're looking at mischaracterizations, let's step back for one moment and look at what has already been said. One of the biggest issues that you've had so far is that the Democratic Party has been blamed for ambassador deaths and foreign policy issues. Just how we're not talking about the elephant in the room, Donald Trump and his wall, we're also not talking about the Pope who said that he is not a Christian and talked about how horrible his policies have been on an international scale. Looking out, that is a mischaracterization as much as it is to say that the foreign policy experience or the foreign policy expressed thus far from the Obama administration is a reflection on the uh, current Democratic candidates. That is a mischaracterization as well, and I think that's something that... And you're you making a mischaracterization <laughs> because Donald Trump is not president of the United States, but President Obama is. Yes, and Hillary Clinton isn't president, and nor is B uh, Bernie Sanders. Well, as, as, we all, as we all know, this election cycle is going to be... What about you, James? What do you... Uh <clears throat> think about this. Well, with earmarks, I think the best example looking at exact implementation is looking at how the Department of Transportation uses it. The first example I draw, draw on is the 2009 spending bill. We saw up to 8,500 or so earmarks on that bill alone, and most of those funds went directly to transportation and infrastructure issues. Looking maybe, for example, into the most uh, latest uh, issue up in Alaska, you have about $2 billion in unused bills used uh, from earmarks going to important infrastructure in Alaska and roadways that are much needed. We're looking at corridors that have not been maintenanced, not been worked on in years, finally getting the attention it deserves, and all thanks to earmarks. What, what about you, James? What, what do you think? Well, well, I, I like to play devil's advocate to, to, uh, uh, to, to you here. Um, when you're talking about these example cities, like you said, D.C., Seattle, San Francisco, those type of cities, mm -hmm. if I'm playing devil's advocate here, I'm going to say that increasing minimum wage hurts those locals. It hurts those residents. If you pull out each one of those cities, you're also going to find the highest uh, 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 prices for housing there, and that affects locals. They can't afford the houses they live in because we're increasing minimum wage. Another issue is, is increasing competition. We say that, you know, we live in a, in a, in a country that uh, uh, has an enterprise of competition. We live in, cap in capitalism. But if you look at comp the competition being increased, we're pushing out more qualified, more uh, a a energetic workers just so they can just, like you use for the example for Brazil, be a flash in the pan to just get the newest guy in there. Mm -hmm. And the other issue that you have is that it, as it continues to intensify, you have an issue of small businesses not being able to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there you see, like you said for the other examples, having to shutter their windows, having mm -hmm. to close their doors. Mm -hmm. And that affects small businesses and that affects mm -hmm. domestic politics mm -hmm. and domestic economies. Mm -hmm. So what is your response to those cities that are able to do it, like you said? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that just hurt them even if they're able to sustain it now? Yeah, so um, I think those are all good things to be concerned about. You know, it can take forever to, to, to get them to act. To, 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 to bounce off that, when you look at executive orders, I, I, I agree in part and, and dissent in part. Because when you want to look at uh, um, uh, uh, executive orders, you want to look at the person that, you know, who has the highest and lotus, lowest amount of executive orders in order to try to measure. And again, you, you're, you're dealing in superlatives. You're saying what is the greatest and what is the worst. If you want to deal in superlatives then, and uh, uh, I, I would say that, look at FDR, 3,522 executive orders for his entire administration. That's nearly a, a executive order per day. But it, you're talking now of, of a different presidency because his, his administration was 16 years compared to the right. normal eight. Uh, okay, so if you want to look at Obama's administration and we look at the entirety of the executive orders, if we have for FDR one per day, the actual statistic for Obama comes out to 0 0.09. 
per day, executive orders. You've looked that up. I, I, I'm, I, impressed. I, I, I'm I, impressed. I'm impressed. I'm impressed.